Okay, so a lot of times you deal with objects moving in a circle, and there are a couple different ways to look at this. Uh, we could just say the object's moving in a circle, it has some velocity v, vector, uh, and that velocity changes in direction, but, but it's moving at a constant magnitude of velocity. That's, that's one way. But it turns out that that's kind of difficult, right? Because here I have the velocity, and then here I have the position, which I'll just draw like this. It has some x value and some y value, so I have, even the position has two coordinates, x and y. But the ball, let's say it's a ball moving in a circle, it's constrained to move in this, this path. And it's essentially a one-dimensional system, right? It can only go along this path. Imagine you cut this and just spread it out. Now it's just a straight line. It's just moving in a straight line. It's not a straight line. I didn't say that. Don't tell me I said that. I said it's like moving in a straight line. So it turns out that there is a different way to describe the motion of this object moving around in a circle. And then you have to move at a constant velocity. Let's say that I have some variable theta. Theta is the angle, uh, and this is actually just like you have in polar coordinates. It's the angle that describes the location of that. So instead of using coordinates x and y, I, two coordinates, I can use one coordinate the angle theta to describe the location of this. So theta could go from zero to pi over two to pi all the way over to two, two pi, right? It can go all the way around. Okay, well, if that's true, then I need to know this distance right here, and I'm gonna call that s. So suppose that this ball started right here and it moved up there, I wanna know that distance. Well, think about this. The circumference of a circle is two pi r. Right, that's the distance all the way around. But if I use this angle theta right here, it hasn't gone all the way around. How much has it gone? Well, it's gone theta over two pi. So this curve right here, s, would be the circumference times theta over two pi. Right, it's the fraction of the total circumference. Well, if I put in the circumference right there, I get two pi r theta over two pi equals r theta. So that's important. I'm going to put a box around it. S equals R theta. So if I know the radius of the circle and I know the angle, I can find the distance along this curved path along the circle. And we call I call that S. Uh, it's the same as the arc length equation. Note, theta in radians, right? Because this ratio only works, that's 2 pi radians, that has to be in radians too. That has to be in radians. So this is going to be something I would encourage you to do, to use theta and radians in this case. Okay, now what if it's moving with some velocity? Well, then I can find uh, the, the speed of the magnitude, which I'll just call v. v would be delta s over delta t, right? It's how far along this it moved in some time interval delta t. Well, I could write this as delta r theta delta t, right? So that's s is r theta. And r is constant, it doesn't change. So I can actually pull that out of the delta and I get r delta theta over delta t. And we call this delta theta over delta t the rate that theta changes. And we use the Greek symbol omega. Omega equals delta theta over delta t. So you see here I get v equals r omega. So this is a relationship between the, the speed, not the direction, the speed as it moves along here, and the rate that the theta changes. So we call omega the angular velocity, and this equation only works if omega is in radians per second. Well, radians for, for minute work too, but you definitely want that in radians. And that's the relationship between angular velocity and linear velocity. Okay, finally we have one more thing. What if it's actually speeding up as it goes along here? I could say A is delta V over delta T, right? That's the definition of acceleration. And yes, I can use this for delta V. I get, and the R is constant, so I get R delta omega over delta T. And we call delta omega over delta T, we define that to be alpha, the angular acceleration. It's the rate that the angular velocity changes. Uh, so we get A equals R alpha. So here are my angular quantities, theta, omega, 
alpha and my linear quantities s, v, and a. But wait, there's more. Suppose that I have this kinematic equation, v final equals v initial plus a times t. I'll say starting at t equals zero. So that's a, the very basic kinematic equation. Uh, and now what if I put in vf, it's going to be r omega f, right? The final velocity is the radius times the angular velocity. That works. And vi is r times omega i. And then a is going to be r times alpha. Let's put these in up here, and this becomes uh, r omega f equals r omega i plus r alpha t. And in this case, all the r's cancel, and I get omega f equals omega i plus alpha t. And compare that to this. It looks the same, but instead of velocity, I have angular velocity. Instead of acceleration, I have angular acceleration. But that kinematic equation still works. I can do the same thing for the position. S final equals S initial plus V initial T plus one half A T squared. That's another kinematic equation. And if I put in S equals R theta final equals R theta initial, that's just S, plus V is going to be r omega initial t plus one half r alpha t squared. So I just replaced all these with their equations that relate them to the angular velocities. Again, the r's all cancel. So I get theta final equals theta initial plus omega initial t plus one half alpha t squared. And that looks just like this other kinematic equation, uh, but instead of positions, we have angular positions. Instead of velocity, I have angular velocity. Instead of acceleration, I have angular acceleration. And then we can do the same thing for the last equation. We have v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2 alpha uh, s final minus s initial. Yeah, I'm using s because I don't want to say x or y because I said we're moving away from that. That's what that is. Uh, this becomes omega final squared equals omega initial squared. That's an a. Plus 2 alpha theta final minus theta initial. And so there's your kinematic equations for rotational motion. So the same ideas that apply work here. Okay. Just make sure that all of these quantities are in radians, radians per second, or radians per second squared. That's going to be your best bet. Now, if you have like omega equals uh, 33 RPM, you'll need to convert that right to radians per second. So let me show you how you do that real quick. Because that's a common one. RPM is a very common one to see. Uh, I guess for record players, which no one remembers anything about record players, and that's fine. Okay, so let's say omega equals 33 RPM. Well, I'm going to write that as 33 revolutions per minute. That's what that means, re RPM. Now, the key to unit conversion is to multiply by 1, right? So if I want to convert from radians, from revolutions to radians, I'm going to say, well, I know that there are 2 pi radians, and I'll write it out as rad, in 1 revolution. And so I can multiply 33 revolutions per minute, multiply it by the fraction 2 pi radians over 1 revolution, because this is 1. 2 pi radians is 1 revolution. So this is not something crazy. I'm just multiplying by the number 1. But the revolution units cancel. And then I can do the same thing for minutes. I can say there are, in 1 minute, there are 60 seconds. And the minutes cancel. So then I get omega equals 33 times 2 pi divided by 60 radians per second. And let's get that as a number. Sorry, I left my calculator over there. Okay, so this I'm not sponsored by Texas Instrument. I just want you to know. I'm just using this calculator because I found it. I don't really like calculators. 33 times 2 times pi 
I can never find pi. There it is, pi, divided by 60. And I get, I can't see that, 3.46 radians per second. Okay, there you go. Hope that helps.